to study um, how our behavior impacts uh, the amount of food that we potentially overserve ourselves. And I thought that stress and mood um, might relate to this. Many researchers over the years have been really interested in identifying what factors drive food waste, you know, who wastes more or less, and what are the motivating um, influences behind that. However, a lot of this past research has really been focused on the household level or with kind of generalized adult populations. And we've noticed that there is very few uh, studies focusing on college campuses, even though in the United States, colleges and universities feed millions of students every year. And this could potentially be a place where a lot of food gets wasted. I designed a survey um, that assessed uh, food security, perceived stress, some also college life experience, demographics, um, and food waste and behavior. And I administered it here at the San Juan Dining Hall. I weighed the food using a digital scale. We did find that people who reported moderate levels of stress wasted the most food. So it's a you have to be right in that, that middle category of not too stressed, but um, not too low stressed um, to, to waste the most food. And also, as you mentioned, we can't explicitly say what's driving this, what the causal relationship is, but we can speculate to some of the things based on what we know about stress in general. If you're too high stressed, you're not um, taking care of yourself properly. Sometimes we're, we do just forget to eat if you're too stressed. Um, you're also in more of a fight or flight mode and your instinct is, is not prioritizing. Um, feeding yourself. Low stress people um, may just really be taking their time with their food and, and eating more of it. Uh, but if you're moderately stressed, um, you may be wasting more food. You know, these are real results conducted scientifically that we can take straight to our own campus and find ways to apply and build off of to really affect behavior and sustainability in a place that we care about here at Fort Lewis. Yeah, so my project essentially analyzes um, the concept of legal validity, which is essentially um, when and where do we have a genuine obligation to follow the law as written. What is a good law? What is a bad law? When is it worth following? Um, my project essentially looks for the conditions or factors that need to be in place in order for the general population to um, have a duty, uh, in a sense, to follow that law. So this is a project in the philosophy of law. It's the kind of thing that, that would govern or try to describe what it is that a judge does when she decides a really difficult case. You know, what are the kind of things that she could appeal to to interpret a law one way rather than another? And up until this point, most legal theorists and philosophers have thought that validity was an all or nothing conception. Laws are either perfectly valid or they're not, and there's no in between. And the novelty of Ben's approach is that he's trying to imagine validity on a kind of sliding scale or a continuum. And that's a really neat move that no one's made in the literature before. So essentially a weakly valid law produces uh, a smaller or uh, less persuasive reason to follow the law. Um, there is still a reason there, but it may not be enough to get you to act in some certain fashion or way. Well, I think it's important to understand the difference between good and bad law because we need to be able to assess our responsibilities and obligations, one, to each other, and two, to the uh, overarching government structure that we all live under every day. And I think it's important to know, essentially, um, how to act properly in society and what is the rules and regulations, what are the rules and regulations that are necessary uh, to follow in order to act properly. Okay, so we've been working on creating a treatment for leishmaniasis. Leishmaniasis is a subtropical disease that's usually found in Brazil and some parts of India. And it comes from when you contract the bite of a sandfly and the parasite enters your bloodstream. If this goes untreated, it usually leads to death. It's the second leading cause of death in terms of parasitic disease only to malaria, but most people haven't heard of it. The current treatment for it is called miltefacine, and we want to create a drug that is more effective 
and less harmful to your body. We found that with anti leishmaniasis activity or the ability for a drug to kill the parasite, it had to cause an increase in reactive oxygen species in your body. And reactive oxygen species are kind of like little pieces of TNT that can end up destroying your DNA and other parts of the cell. We've made a couple of the compounds that we want to test and we've sent them off to the bio department and they've currently been testing it against their leishmaniasis cells. They found that these compounds are about as potent as some current treatments for the disease so it could it, it, it's very promising at least this preliminary data is. So I think the most important part in thinking about this is that it's considered a neglected disease by the World Health Organization, so not many people are studying it. And because it's impacting impoverished communities, there's not a lot of money being forwarded to research in this area. So we have an opportunity with our funding in the chemistry department to actually provide more studies on it. Okay, so my name is Asa Lasky, and for the past two years I've been doing research with Dr. Caroline Kuleza in the biology department on a herpes virus called human cytomegalovirus. So this virus globally has a prevalence of 50 to 90 percent in the adult population and is also the leading infectious cause of birth defects like hearing loss and other neurological disorders. <music> We're specifically interested in the molecular mechanisms that transition this virus from a cell-killing infectious phase to a more dormant phase. And we're really interested in this viral protein called UL25 and its effect on that transition. So we've engineered viruses that are deficient in this protein and have infected them into cell lines to see the impacts on disease when UL25 is not there. And hopefully this research will assist in the development of treatments or vaccines for people with the virus. So um, what, what ACE has really done are, it has, is to generate the tools that we need to answer these questions. Um, to study viruses, um, the, the approach that we've taken is to make changes to the genetic material and then ask what's the consequence of that change. And so ACE is really building the tools to ask the questions about, is this protein UL25 important for this transition from cell killing to dormancy? And um, so he's really, so once we, now that we've recovered those viruses, we're able to start to ask those deeper questions about that particular process in cells. Well, if this protein does have a really significant effect on the disease associated with this virus, then we could perhaps assist in developing treatments or vaccines related to targeting that protein that would help uh, treat people with the disease. I am exploring this semester storytelling. There's many different forms of storytelling, um, but throughout this semester I've identified two major forms, oral traditions and written archives. Throughout different generational cycles, which still affect us today, of colonization, conquest, globalization, and genocide, there's been a violent severance between oral traditions and written archives. And what this this rip has done is it's created a dominant storyteller. In doing that, we have lost an unimaginable amount of culture, perspective, language. And perhaps most importantly, what I've come to learn with this project is stories are living, dynamic, evolutionary beings. And we've lost beings. Um, and this affects different cultures differently. And so within this wound, within this complex problem, I'm trying to make sense of how can we reimagine our collective story together um, and reframe our narrative? And that this semester has emerged through community storytelling, through the nuance of a zine compilation, poetry events, open mics. And we also have a community storytelling event on Sunday, May 1st. And this is going to involve individuals coming to Rotary Park and sharing a five to eight minute personal story from their lives with the community audience. And the idea here, it's very similar to poetry circles and open mics that I've been involved with for many years, that we want to create a space where people feel safe to share themselves and they feel heard by their community. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it's been really amazing to see how Ellis is integrating so much of her previous coursework and other parts of her lives, um, being involved in the arts and the community organizing and activism to come together in a senior research project. I think my role is to kind of help put a theoretical frame um, and work together to think about the, the theoretical frame that matches the really great grounded work that she's doing. We really have to return to the roots of listening to one another, truly eye contact, speaking our stories aloud, because when that happens, um, it, it brings the story to life and it really touches into this deep, ancient, intrinsic element of humanity that I don't think we have access to in our day-to-day -day lives, which is why I was so drawn to creating an event where people are sharing their stories orally. So any beer that you drink is gonna have four basic ingredients. You have water, grain, yeast, and hops. Hops are what bring most of the flavor and aroma into a beer. So brewers will go out to a hop farm and they will smell the hops in hopes of getting an idea of what the final product is going to smell and taste like. The problem is there is something that we refer to as biotransformation. Throughout the brewing process, the compounds and molecules that come off of the hops are transformed. And so the final product can smell and taste totally different from the initial hops. So we are working on developing methods to better understand those biotransformations. Right now, in the brewing process involves a lot of trial and error in order to get the desired flavor in the final product. And so all of that trial and error can result in a lot of waste of hops. And hops are pretty limited resource, they only grow well in certain areas in the world. And so by developing these methods with SCA here in town, we are hoping to maximize our hop use efficiency and reduce the demand on hops and ultimately have a positive environmental impact. So it's really interesting work. It's gonna help us fine tune um, what, how we dial in our recipes for specific beer styles and moving forward, hopefully, analyzing hops when we contract them in the future. I really appreciate Mike's environmental science perspective on this project because that is really the end goal. That's why people will fund this research is increasing the efficiency of hopped beer production. Um, um, is a, like a really strong motivation for Scott to be involved and for other breweries to be interested in this data, so. I've really learned how fundamental listening is within all of that and there's so much that I don't know. Being here at the fort has kind of helped me realize what I want to do and that's currently like uh, develop the CRISPR-Cas9 technology to treat or cure genetic diseases. I would love to continue doing this kind of work. There's a few different paths that I could go down but for now I'm probably going to guide boats. <laughs> you could do research while you're guiding boats. Yes. I do. Yeah. Uh, so I really want to continue working with the food systems, especially with uh, marginalized communities like the uh, native population. Well, there's a couple dual degree programs that I'm looking at that allow me to get my master's in uh, specifically the philosophy of law and then get a JD so I could be a practicing lawyer also. So I kind of get the best of both worlds. After I graduate, I'm planning on applying to PhD programs so then I can continue to do like drug design research at other labs too, and then possibly open my lab, my own lab, where I could promote a sense of diversity there as well, because that's another thing that I'm really passionate about.